Good evening and warm greetings to everyone. Welcome to this virtual panel discussion on COVID-19 and violence against women and girls being organized by Center for Gender Studies, Institute for Human Development. I am Priyanka Tyagi, the Senior Manager of Program Administration and Communication with IHD. Uh, in our earlier webinars, we have looked into uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19 on various aspects of labor and employment. In this panel discussion, however, we are now going, in, going to deliberate on a very pertinent issue of violence against women and girls due to the uh, impact of COVID-19. And I'm very excited and honored that I am right now sharing screen with all the exponents and the experts in gender studies, and they are going to explore this dimension uh, of the impact of COVID-19. So before I formally start the uh, proceedings of this session, I would uh, just very quickly uh, speak to our uh, participants who are, uh, uh, I'm very thankful to them. We have had a huge registration. We've got a huge support, close to 750 registrations. Uh, in fact, it is also growing right now. The numbers are increasing. People are joining in more and more. They have regist registered. However, as I said, we, were, uh, we are a little constrained uh, with uh, since we can only accommodate 500 people, so we will also be we are also going live on YouTube, and uh, which is slightly delayed due to a technical hassle. So this is being recorded and it will be available on YouTube after the discussion as well. And uh, our YouTube chan uh, channel is IHD India. So please do visit our YouTube uh, channel if you are not able to connect here. However, you are most welcome and uh, very uh, warm welcome to all of you. Second thing is that uh, I would also request you to please place your questions on the Q&A tab, which is available on your screens, uh, which is after the first speaker starts speaking, you may uh, start engaging uh, with us. And on YouTube also, you can engage with us uh, through the comment boxes. So I would now call upon uh, the coordinator of Center for Gender Studies uh, at IHD. She's Dr. Tanuka Endo. She's also a professor at the Institute. She's worked on a range of issues, including human development with focus on education, sustainable development, gender issues, urban development, etc. So I invite her to welcome all of you uh, to welcome our esteemed panelists, our moderator, to introduce the Center for Gender Studies and to formally commence the proceedings of this session. So yes, uh, Dr. Tanuka Endo, please. Thank you so much, Priyanka. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, on behalf of the Center for Gender Studies at IHD, I extend a very warm welcome uh, to our respected chairperson and moderator for the evening, Dr. Asha Kapoor Mehta the three esteemed panelists for the evening, and to also to all of you attending today's virtual panel discussion on COVID-19 and violence against women and girls. So right now to begin with, let me say a few words about the Center for Gender Studies. Uh, it was set up to train focus on research on contributions by women and the constraints faced by women in South Asia with focus uh, on India. And here we gratefully remember late Professor Preet Rustadi at IHD, whose contribution in this area uh, of research, it has really been in our inspiration throughout. At the, gender, the Center for Gender Studies, we focus on exploring cross-cutting nature of gender issues uh, because it has intersections with caste, class, religion, and so many other axes. So by, and also it aims to act as a forum for collaborative research. By doing so, we aim to have the process of evidence-based policy formulation in this area. Now, we have organized some events around important issues such as care work and women empowerment. We had organized a very big panel discussion on care and labor market jointly with IDRC and also a round table on uh, rethinking the discourse on women's economic empowerment. Uh, it was jointly organized with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and IWAGE. Participants in these events, they came from all over the world and they brought diverse voices together. And uh, we really hope that this evening also we can replicate the same experience for you. IHG has conducted many studies around gender issues, including uh, violence against uh, women in rural India, gender discrimination among children up to six years of age, women's uh, work participation and the multiplier effect and so on. And at the center, we would like to carry forward research in this direction. Now coming to the topic for today's uh, panel discussion, it is just needless to reiterate how important it is to address this issue. And uh, we know that National Family Health Survey data, they tell us that 
more than 30% of ever married women aged 15 to 49 years in India as of 2015-16, they've ever experienced spousal violence. And what is more alarming is that, you know, spousal violence has widespread acceptability among women. So really it is an issue which needs urgent address. And there are also after COVID uh, and following lockdown, there have been a lot of reports about increase in uh, violence against women. And there have also been reports, you know, uh, information regarding reduced reporting of these incidents. So obviously it's a matter of great concern. And the panel discussion today, it assumes great importance in this context. And we really hope that we will bring rich insights on this issue based on experience from across the world. Let me now introduce uh, the chairperson and the panelists. Uh, professor Asha Kapoor Mehta, she's a visiting professor at IHD and the chairperson for the Center for Gender Studies at IHD. She's also a senior advisor at IWAID, erstwhile professor of economics for a long time at the Indian Institute for Public Administration. She has served on several committees constituted by the government of India. In the capacity of a member, working group of feminist economist, as chair of the subgroup on gender mainstreaming and effective accountability mechanisms, as a member of working group on women's agency and empowerment for the 12th plan, and also as a member of Ministry of Women and Child Development Task Force, for preparing a handbook and manual on gender budgeting. These are among others roles and responsibilities she has served. Her publications include, uh, the, um, they uh, span the issues of poverty, poverty dynamics, human and gender development indicators, gender budgeting, and so on. Now coming to the panelists for the evening, uh, we start with Dr. Shruti Majumdar. She is a monitoring and evaluation specialist with the UN Trust Fund to end violence against women. And she will present the global impact from the perspective of the UNTF's grantees, who actually comprise the grassroots organizations in the front lines of this issue, and in as many as 80 countries. So we'll have a very, very uh, rich uh, insight into this data. Ms. Rashmi Singh, she is the executive director programs for International Foundation for Crime Prevention and Victim Care. She will present the impact of the pandemic on survivors in India. And also uh, she will talk about the difficulties of data interpretation during this period. Dr. Lorna Messina Hussein uh, is a program specialist with UN Trust Fund to end violence against women. She will discuss the implications on the funding landscape from a donor perspective. And she will also highlight the need uh, for investment in civil society organizations, because in many cases, they are acting as first responders in the front lines during the pandemic. Now, um, right, uh, I just take a second to invite all the participants here to share your experience as well as thoughts on the topic of discussion today at this following mail ID, mail at the rate ihdindia.org. Priyanka will compile all these and share the same with everyone so that we gain a deeper insight into the topic of violence against women and girls based on all the participants' experience as well. Now, without taking any more time, I would request respected chairperson, Dr. Asha Kapoor Mehta, to please say a few words and start the proceedings for the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Tanuka. Our uh, Center for Gender Studies at the Institute for Human Development is privileged to be organizing this panel discussion on an issue that is of paramount importance, the issue of COVID-19 and violence against women and girls. The refrain from everywhere, you know, over the last couple of months, ever since the pandemic hit us, is stay home, stay safe. But what do you say to a woman or a girl who knows that staying home may not be safe for her. And there are, you know, for most of us, staying home is staying safe. But there's a large proportion of women and girls for whom staying home is not safe. Violence against women and girls takes so many different forms. It occurs inside the home and it also occurs outside the home. This 
violence against women pandemic is a persistent global reality that has been with us across the centuries and across geographies the coronavirus pandemic has come and hopefully will go away soon but this is a pandemic that we really need to address and need to address now it occurs across all income groups it occurs across all castes across all cultures across all geographies as i have already said it worsens in times of crisis such as the health pandemic because of the increased deprivation that comes with the health pandemic because of the lack of resources that it brings with it because of lack of income opportunities because of increased care work and because of the fears and anxieties that all of us are facing as we try and make sure that we hide behind masks and hide inside our homes and don't test covid positive staying home provides protection from outsiders stalkers rapists and kidnappers however if the abuser is inside is an insider being locked down could mean being locked in with the perpetrator and that's the worry in the present time over the next hour our esteemed panelists are going to be sharing their experiences lived realities and insights based on the work that they are doing day in and day out on violence faced by women and girls during the lockdown and the sorts of response mechanisms that they have developed in order to deal with the issue and make it easier for their grassroots partners to support the women who are in trouble and in need their presentations will be followed by questions and answers for about half an hour but before i invite shruti to speak shruti is our first panelist let me very briefly share three strands of evidence uh, professor tanuka endau has already talked about the nfhs 2015 16 data uh, so i i just want to touch on that briefly and then just touch again very briefly on a few media reports and then on uh, you know something from ncw and child line the evidence from uh, from nfhs4 which is which pertains to 2015 16 makes it very clear that 30% of women have experienced some form of physical violence in india that's physical violence from someone it could be anyone inside or outside the home these are these are people who are you know they're talking about above the age of 15 33% of ever married women have experienced spousal violence that's one third and this corresponds with global evidence that tells us that one in three women experienced domestic violence or intimate par uh, intimate partner violence in their lifetime the sorts of injuries that are listed in nfhs4 make you know really uh, you know sort of you know it's it's really it makes you feel awful as you read them because they talk about eye injuries and sprains and dislocations and burns and deep wounds broken bones broken teeth other serious in injuries being slapped being pushed being shaken having you know and various but you know but what's even more worrying is that of the list of people who face all of these only 14% of women who experienced physical or sexual violence by anyone actually sought help for that violence and this is down from 24% in nfhs3 so between 2005 6 and 2015 16 you have a decline in the percentage of of those who are suffering from violence who are willing to ask for help down from 24% to only 14% what does this mean this means that 86% of women who have experienced physical or sexual violence by anyone have not sought help to stop that violence and this is the big worry because data or evidence can capture only what actually gets reported there's a lot that doesn't get reported and what doesn't get reported doesn't get captured so what you're seeing is really the tip of the eye of the iceberg the bits that got reported the ncrb data that we get right which is the crime records bureau data that captures an even smaller fraction of this because all it captures is data for which uh, is cases for which an fir has been lodged so of those who may call a helpline there are very few who will actually go ahead and report that and, and uh, that crime and lodge an fir at a police station and then there are issues down the line with regard to the way that administrative data is reported but other data uh, shows us that during 
April and May 2020, this is during the lockdown, 47% of the 3,027 complaints received by NCW or the National Commission for Women, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, actually, but that is only 1428, that is 1,428 out of 3,027 complaints received by NCW pertained to domestic and intimate partner violence. Almost half of those who reported a crime said it was due to intimate partner violence during this phase. This is far higher than what was reported earlier. Part of this could be because of a WhatsApp helpline number that NCW had set up, but part of it is also because crime has, because violence and intimate partner violence has increased. A survey conducted by the Tamil Nadu Women's Collective in 62 villages in Tamil Nadu indicated that 81% of families reported some kind of domestic violence during the lock lockdown. So this is in rural areas, 81% of households, you know, are, are reporting that some kind of domestic violence had occurred. This is yesterday's Hindu. On a positive note, 71% of those households also recorded an increase in the involvement of men in household chores during lockdown. But very worryingly, the Hindu also reported on 8th April 2020 that in just 11 days between the 20th and 31st of March, child line 1098, the helpline for children in distress, got, received 3.07 lakh calls of which 30% were about protection against abuse and violence on children. In other words, more than 92,000 SOS calls were calling or asking for protection of children from abuse and violence in just 11 days. And this is during the lockdown. So this is a somber indication that the lockdown has turned in, into a kind of extended captivity, not just for many women, but also for children who've been trapped with their abusers uh, in, at home. So, you know, so these, this again is from a report in the Hindu, which uh, reported on this, you know, on the 8th of April. With this, let me invite uh, Dr. Shruti Mujumdar to make her presentation based on the rapid assessment that they've conducted in 80 countries across the globe on the impact of COVID-19 on civil society organizations that have been working to end violence against women and girls. A brief, uh, a note to add to what Tanuka has already said about Shruti. Shruti is monitoring and evaluation specialist at the United Nations Trust Fund to End Violence Against Women. This fund is administered by UN Women for direct programmatic and m and &E support to CSOs who are working on ending violence against women. She also leads the work relating to the evidence hub strategy and research partnerships. She wants to build the evidence base for effectively finding ways that will end violence against women in low and middle income countries. She has a PhD from, uh, in sociology from Brown University and a BA in sociology from Delhi University. Welcome Shruti, uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Fantastic, thank you so much, uh, Professor Mehta for having us and thank you, it's such a pleasure to be here today. And thank you also for setting the stage for, for what, what I will be uh, speaking about, about the challenges of working in this field and under-reporting. And um, I mean, it's a sobering reality, but um, it's, it's extremely challenging to actually have accurate data on this. So thank you very much. And uh, can, you, can someone confirm if you're able to see my screen? Yes, we can see the screen, but if you can speak a little louder. Sure. Superb. So before diving in, I'll get into, uh, I'll say a little bit about who we are. Is the volume okay now, Professor Mehta? Yes, it is. Great, thanks. So the UN Trust Fund is, is a global grant-making mechanism, as uh, Professor Mehta said. It came into being in 1996 through a General Assembly resolution. And we fund uh, civil society organizations that work on ending violence against women and girls. Our active portfolio right now is 144 grants in 69 countries um, with almost 50 million US dollars in investment. Most of our CSOs self-identify as women's rights organizations and they work in three areas. So we have organizations that work on prevention and that tackle the root causes of violence and harmful social norms. We have organizations that directly provide services to survivors, for example, shelters, legal aid centers, healthcare services, psychosocial therapy. 
And then we have a third category of grantees that push for progressive laws and implementation of those laws, um, national action plans and policies within their countries. In light of COVID and the lockdown measures that followed, we, we reached out to all our grantees and conducted a rapid assessment with really sort of four objectives. One was to assess the impact of uh, the outbreak on violence against women and girls, the impact on civil society organizations and frontline organizations and their, their operations and programming, the adaptations that they made very quickly in this time in the front line, and to assess their short and long-term needs sort of going forward. In mid-March, we sent out 10 open-ended questions to all 144 grantees, and we're just immensely grateful that all of them responded and sent multiple updates, which amounted to over 600 pages of text data from 69 countries in four languages, and the data is still coming in as the situation continues to evolve. So this is really a sort of living analysis. These responses were then translated, analyzed, and clustered by thematic. And I will dive right into the findings on impact. So our first finding is that grantees are really sort of reporting an alarming increase in violence against women and girls as a direct result of social isolation measures across all five regions that the trust fund operates in. And this violence is occurring in multiple forms. The most common form that's being reported so far is intimate partner violence and being primarily driven by stress, unemployment and economic insecurity due to the quarantine measures. Several grantees are also reporting an increase in child abuse and exploitation. In some countries, they're also reporting an increase in forced teenage pregnancies and atrocities faced by girls under lockdown. Sexual violence is on the rise as well, as reported through our grantees who are operating shelters and hotlines. Violence in conflict and post-conflict settings is on the rise. For instance, one of our grantees that operates a shelter and provides counseling to survivors of ISIS violence in Iraq has reported a doubling of intake requests since the lockdown. And we'll hear a lot more from Lorna about what is going on in these particular settings. Emotional and economic abuse as a direct result of food shortages is rampant, particularly for women and girls with disabilities who are being denied access to basic necessities within their households. Assault by law enforcement has increased. In several parts of the world, the militarization of daily life in an effort to enforce the lockdown and curfew has led to repression by law enforcement, particularly of women and girls who are leaving homes to fetch firewood, to fetch water, to work in informal markets, to feed their families. And finally, femicides have increased, which is particularly alarming. And just to say, this is not a static picture. The situation is rapidly evolving as we speak. So the forms, the frequency, and the intensity of violence is shifting. So even if you look at that very first example of intimate partner violence, our grantee from Palestine initially reported that it began as an increase in psychological and economic violence. Then there were more calls in physical and sexual violence. And now they report that the number of cases that are a threat to women's life has increased and is significantly higher than an average week pre-pandemic. An unfortunate reality is that this isn't new. Violence against women has existed and it's existed long before the pandemic. And the pandemic didn't really cause it, but it certainly caused an exacerbation of the underlying risk factors that lead to violence. Which brings me to our second finding, which is that there are multiple pathways through which uh, violence is actually increasing and civil society has really sort of drawn our attention to the compounded effect of these pathways that i'm about to talk about these are not occurring in isolation we have to remember these are all co-occurring risk factors so the fact that there are food shortages within lockdowns is a lethal combination that is increasing the risk of ipv economic abuse and starvation the fact that there's school closures within lockdowns are making girls more vulnerable to sexual harassment, exploitation, female genital mutilation, uh, forced child marriages, all as coping mechanisms. The fact that several of the institutions within which our grantees have beneficiaries have women and girls that they serve, for example, hospitals, custodial institutions, asylum centers, and now quarantine centers, these were all cut off. And the fact that they were cut off from the women and girls inside raises the risk of violence from men and staff within these institutions. In some countries, alcohol abuse, but also alcohol withdrawal is triggering abuse and humiliation within the household. And you will hear more from Rashmi on this in her presentation. And finally, suspended public transport within the lockdown 
implies that survivors are unable to exit violent situations and seek help and get to essential services. Even if survivors made it to essential services, right, access to these are now completely disrupted in most parts of the world, particularly to healthcare, to justice, and to social protection. Survivors in vulnerable groups are struggling to access essential medical services and supplies, as well as access to sexual and reproductive health services. Our grantee from Morocco, for instance, reports how adolescent girls that have experienced forced pregnancies are unable to access healthcare and are resorting to extremely risky abortion methods. Access to justice has been slowed. In several countries, closed courts or arbitration only in urgent cases has impeded and needed judicial protection for survivors. In addition, some countries are reporting that survivors whose husbands were in custody for domestic violence were released to minimize the spread of infection inside prisons. And finally, the lack of access to social protection, the fact that several national ID offices were closed at this time, and the fact that any form of social assistance post-COVID hasn't really reached the most vulnerable women and girls and survivors, especially those with disabilities or those in refugee camps, is particularly dangerous at this time. Given all of the above and given the constraints, we know now that violence is hardly being reported through formal channels to police, to, to, to health services. And what we know is via informal community-based structures, through the referral pathway set up by NGOs, through NGO-run shelters and services. Hence, really sort of relying on administrative data, police data, health data at this time will not be enough. Data collection at this time poses considerable ethical risks. So at this time, we really have to listen to NGOs grounded in the voices of survivors, because we know the issue of violence within the context of the pandemic has not been prioritized in most countries and is likely, as Professor Mehta said, is likely to largely remain invisible. When it comes to the impact um, on very directly on the programming that of, um, of CSOs, our grantees are really sort of operating in three areas, as I mentioned before, and all three of them are impacted. So if we, if we talk about prevention programs that typically use one of the following entry points to raise awareness, right? Schools, um, they can't continue because of indefinite school closures. Those that are using communities and face-to-face -face trainings and sessions can no longer do so. Those that are supporting small businesses run by at-risk women and survivors are now shut down. And those that are working with marginalized groups such as sex workers have lost access to their beneficiaries overnight because several of them have gone underground. When it comes to services, those that provide services themselves, for example, those that are operating shelters, providing psychosocial counseling or legal aid, they're just experiencing a massive surge in intake. And CSOs that train essential service providers, that train police, that train healthcare workers in, 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 in survivor-centered approaches, they are unable to continue their work as well because these two services are now completely diverted for COVID-19 response and preparedness. And finally, CSOs that are pushing for progressive legislation are temporarily on hold as well because parliament sittings are now postponed in several countries. And this has led to considerable lost momentum on these issues. And overall, I just want to say for a field of work that really sort of relies on face-to-face -face intense and frequent interactions, how to ensure women's safety when access to them becomes difficult and where going virtual is not that easy in several parts of the world. So it's really sort of pushing civil society to rethink its very sort of mode of operation. And speaking of operations, the lockdown measures are putting considerable strain on the operations of these organizations as well. Their efforts are now focused on the immediate needs and keeping their beneficiaries alive, especially um, several of those, those who have been pushed into poverty and starvation. CSO premises are being diverted for COVID testing. Those operating shelters are struggling to procure, maintain, procure food, maintain hygiene and healthcare. Frontline staff and women's rights defenders are completely stretched and overwhelmed with the surge. There is now limited communication between staff and communities because several did not have the ICT infrastructure necessary in place to work remotely. Grantees have lost access to beneficiaries in many places and lost momentum. In some contexts, limited bank operations are shaking up their budgets and there are constraints in fundraising as well at this time. And finally, there are serious concerns about maintaining staff and maintaining offices and frontline workers, especially if the crisis continues for longer. When it comes to 
responding to the crisis, civil society at this time has shown an incredible amount of resilience and really adapted themselves to the situation. So CSOs that are operating shelters are maintaining them, they're opening new ones, they're supporting state shelters. So in Liberia and Iraq, our grantees are keeping their safe houses open and making sure they follow health protocols. In Serbia, our grantee Athena has not only kept its own safe houses open, but also when the state operated shelters ran out of food, they activated their reserve fund to support them. In Ethiopia, Ethiopia established a new shelter in the middle of the lockdown in the center of Addis for women and girls who were previously in emergency accommodation at a police station with prisoners. In Argentina, our grantee activated a shelter specifically for those who identify as LGBT because their situation became extremely vulnerable under the pandemic. Then when it comes to CSOs that provide services, they are rapidly expanding their reach and trying to innovate and find, find new ways to reach women. Grantees are adding hotlines, WhatsApp as Prof Professor Mehta mentioned, and several are mobilizing psychologists and lawyers to provide consultations to survivors over the phone. For hard to reach populations or those that do not have phones, they are using community radios to disseminate messaging on how to seek help. And most importantly, civil society at this time is very rapidly strengthening the grassroots and training community members to become the first responders. So training um, local leaders, youth leaders to become community-based counselors and paralegals, or training community health workers in identification or response to violence. And CSOs that work on prevention are really sort of shifting gears to move from primary to secondary prevention. So from preventing violence from occurring to preventing it from reoccurring. So grantees are shifting to cash transfers and cash-based assistance to meet the immediate needs of at-risk women and girls. Some are also engaging very directly with men and boys within their programs to address some of the COVID-related risk factors. Some grantees that are working on income generation activities, for instance, have very quickly pivoted and are now teaching their women how to sew protective masks and produce locally made hand sanitizers. Um, so that's just sort of on, on prevention and services. But overall, one of the things that's really happened across, across the globe is CSOs are acting as a crucial nexus at this time between survivors and governments during the pandemic through their advocacy. So whether, by, whether that comes by generating networks with human rights organizations and ombudsmen, by carefully documenting the shifts in patterns of violence and relaying alerts to national GBV coordination platforms, joining local advocacy groups and coalitions to call for a progressive response to COVID-19, preparing open letters, pushing for accessible dissemination of COVID-19 information and violence, especially for women and girls with, with disabilities, ensuring that local government support for COVID actually reaches at-risk women and girls, advocating for their inclusion in emergency food distribution lists, for example, by the World Food Program, and finally, by integrating COVID sensitization within their programs with their awareness activities in accessible formats in different languages. So I'll stop here, and this was really sort of the bird's eye view of the impacts of the pandemic and my colleague Rashmi will give you a real sort of grassroots perspective on this. And Lorna will say more about how we are responding as the United Nations. But I just want to say sort of one key takeaway for us from all of this is that there's a need for amplified support. There's a need for sustained investment in civil society, especially women's rights organizations across the globe at this moment, because they are the frontline responders to this rapidly evolving pandemic. Thank you very much. And over to you, uh, Professor Mehta. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for that entire set of insights from so many countries across the globe, uh, Shruti. And you know, you did a fabulous job of, of giving us a bird's eye view of, of what's been happening in so many countries and how you all have been responding uh, you know, to much of that. Uh, Rashmi uh, Singh is uh, Executive Director of the International Foundation for Crime Prevention and Victim Care. She's worked at Oxfam. Uh, she's worked with ActionAid and worked at Care India before this. Her area of specialization is in mainstreaming gender into thematic programs, monitoring and evaluation, and integrating gender equity and diversity in interventions on health, 
education, livelihoods, and disaster response, among others. Uh, today, she's going to basically be talking to us about the work that they've been doing on the ground in dealing with the impact of COVID-19 on uh, women uh, victims of uh, violence against women and how they've uh, changed tack in order to deal with the issue and come in with support and the enabling role that's been played by the donors in ensuring that they can adapt uh, to, to the needs of the civil society uh, organization and the grassroots organizations in order to deliver support on the ground. Rashmi, over to you. Uh, uh, before Ms. Rashmi Singh comes in, may I please request uh, Dr. Shruti Majumdar to stop sharing her screen. There's a stop op uh, option on your screen. Can you please stop sharing so that Ms. Uh, Rashmi Singh comes on full view. Shruti, if you can hear me. I can, but I'm struggling to find that button actually. Okay, so uh, allow me please. Huh? So if yeah, if it's possible for you to do that would be great. I have done that. Yes, Ms. Singh, it's all yours. Thanks. Thanks, thanks everyone. And uh, first of all, on behalf of PCBC, I would like to thank the UN Trust and IHD for creating this opportunity and this platform for us to share uh, what has been our experience. And when I'm going to talk about my experience, uh, I think um, the learnings of handling uh, domestic violence in the situation of this pandemic uh, would not have been possible uh, if PCBC wasn't working on this issue for the past 20 years. I think in some way it was a culmination of those learnings that what will work, what will not work. Um, quickly, I will talk about what PCBC is. So we are a Chennai based, uh, it's a Chennai Tamil Nadu based civil society organization. We came into existence in the year 2001 and we have been into providing comprehensive support services to uh, women survivors of uh, domestic violence, intimate partner violence, and family violence. And increasingly over the last three years, we have also now been offering services to, in, to LGBTQI individuals as well. And one of the particular group within that larger group of um, uh, people who are uh, victims of uh, domestic violence, there is a specific group also we work with, which is women burn survivors, which are just not acid sur burn survival, but also fire burn survivors. Um, and when I say comprehensive services, I'm not going to talk now, but I think during my conversation, it will come like, what do we actually mean by a full service model and what is required? Now, coming back to um, uh, the whole pandemic of COVID-19, uh, what all of us we have seen and a lot of my colleagues before this also shared that, uh, you know, we all know uh, that during this period, domestic violence increased. Uh, uh, the, uh, this period also reinforced and reiterated that domestic violence exists. It is not something which is over or it has reduced. And the third is that it reinforced that for many women, home is not a safe haven. Uh, I think that's something which was, which we, which we uh, of course, we know, and but then we learned it all the more. Uh, coming to what happened in India, because it was, it was just not about the COVID-19, the breakout of the virus, but it is actually the lockdown which followed that. And uh, the lockdown is, we all know that what happened was that if we even look at the data, uh, was that National Commission for Women, they have their helpline and their complaint box. And in a period of 26 March to 4th April, they received around 123 complaint, which was almost three times more than the preceding two weeks. Uh, then, we, um, then we also saw that various civil society organizations who were providing support services, they reported. Now, when we come to PCVC, we have a 24 hours uh, domestic violence helpline. Now, uh, what we saw was that quickly when we started hearing news and NCW said, okay, domestic violence has increased, complaints have increased. We, we quickly got together virtually and we said, okay, what do we need to do? And of course, we have to keep our shelter open and all of that. But then when we looked at the last two weeks data and we, we, we saw that on an average, generally, we get around seven to eight calls every day. And in the last two, in those two last week, actually, we had just got around two or three calls. Uh, and we were like, okay, what happened? 
like you know although we are hearing that the violence domestic violence has increased but on our helpline number there are hardly any calls then we we contemplated what's happening and it was more about what we learned is that one is that women maybe are not aware uh, that the services and the shelters are available the other is when you are in the house with the perpetrator and the family how much space it gives the women to even reach out for support is it safe so we quickly what we did was that one is that we went on to social media and we republicized and republicized our 24 hours helpline number but with that we also uh, put our web, uh, the website chat option uh, which was uh, not uh, working before that we activated that and also the whatsapp number and then we saw that there was a surge uh, in in the, the the number of calls which were coming but of course when i say then we got around 400 500 calls in a day but then of course they were not all calls of domestic violence but moment some of the tv channels they flashed that number there were people who were also wanting some humanitarian and crisis support of transportation grocery ration so we had to quickly put a front line team and segregate look for referral database because we also didn't want to keep telling people oh but we work on dv but because there were the people also on crisis so we had to give them like a some response so this is how we geared ourselves and then of course what we realized and our team said that lot of women are actually instead of calling they are sending whatsapp messages and then we realized it is it is safer for women to chat while the other families are not looking at their mobile or they are busy so that's something which uh, and, and as a result and then um, and what we also learned was that when we said okay what 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 kind of support they want and most of the women they said that can someone call him and warn him because he is being very abusive so they were not like wanting to leave the house or the police to come they said i can't leave the house because children there is a lockdown outside i don't know how where to go but i just want somebody to uh, uh, warn um so while all of this was happening and we were also gearing up to the thing it is not that the state machinery does not respond like if we look at tamil nadu state government the anganwadi workers were deputed to the one stop crisis centers immediately uh, then if you look at the jammu and kashmir uh, government uh, they took a so moto action and where some of the pharmacy centers were converted into where women could immediately come out and stay uh, similarly delhi government went out and said message with that um, re, i mean you know effectively implement the pwda act and there should be protection of officers available but what we learned was that and especially that comes from our, our decade uh, of experience of work two decades almost is that this is not enough when a woman is in crisis uh, so there are three things actually we learned from this uh, when we looked at all of this one is that uh, our support system uh, needs to increasingly understand that breaking the 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 cycle of violence is a process so it won't happen like okay immediately you say okay you are not safe come out of the house so you know it's not and then going into legal is something which is uh, which takes a lot of time second thing we learned was about that um, uh, it, it is not black and white solutions the solution might be black and white but the consequences on the life of the women are not black and white so you just can't say okay uh, this is what we have and you can just come here and you know you'll be there but then what are the long term where where she is going to go where is the money coming from and third we learned was about coming up with creative ways and i can give you quickly two ways when when a woman calls you know on a helpline i, I know two cases i can just remember like off hand uh, in one case the woman called and she said this man is really abusing me a lot and there is a threat to my life and what we immediately one of our crisis counselor she did was that uh, the crisis counselor called the man's parents and then they asked asked the parents that can they move the man to the family uh, to his uh, parents family so that the woman can continue to stay in that house with her children and the man was moved to the parents house uh, recently again there was a case in delhi we got on our 24 hour crisis line and there the woman said uh, you are offering me a shelter it was in the middle of the night at 2 o'clock but i can't go because i don't know where that shelter is what if you know if there are corona positive patients what that place is you know to some random place then we said okay what is the next option she said that 
uh, okay, I don't, I don't want this man in the house. Can something be done? And of course, like one of the service providing organization, they had a good contact with the police and they came and they actually they took him. But I'm not sure whether that was a very, you know, a great idea. But the, because it, it also happened that some of these very reactive ways can put the life of the women into more. So what happened in the second case, we had to make sure that next morning, we had to immediately make sure that before he comes back home, the woman is not in the house because it makes them, it has already made the man very angry. So I think these are some of the things which we, which we learned. And also I think, um, uh, um, so what we, we have learned from this entire process and what we had to do with our uh, support services was that if we needed immediate transport and, and arranging the pass was a nightmare because it nowhere listed in the essential services. So it, it wasn't there. Shelter, PCVC shelter was open, but none of the other shelters, there were very few shelters which were open. Even if we had to take the woman in the shelter, at that point of time, immediately, we did not have an isolation or a quarantine ward, which we had to uh, set up. Uh, the other was the courts were closed. Um, so I think when we say then that, you know, what, what, what support services mean during such a pandemic, it is, I think, it, it has to be a very, very coordinated response. And we, 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 of course, as a civil society organization, we geared up our services and we did all of this, which I've spoken about. But I think one of the most important role which was played was by, at least I can name at least the two of our donors. One is the UN Trust Fund and uh, the other donor, which is the Azim Premji Foundation. They really came forward very proactively. And I think the first step uh, the donor took was immediately getting together all the partners and first learning from them that what is the situation on ground. Uh, like, you know, a while ago, Shruti said that it is very important to learn from them because they are completely immersed. So it was, okay, what's happening? And of course, there was one question that, okay, do you see any impact on your agreed project outcomes? And of course, like already Shruti has said that, of course, you can't do a mainstream work in this kind of a situation or whatever your results framework has you committed to. So then I think the next step played by the donor was, okay, uh, one is, of course, while we continue to focus on the larger goal of the program, which we are doing with a particular donor, but how do we tweak it to the, the shifting context? And actually, it was a very interesting exercise to do that, okay, if this is one output and this is one outcome of, let's say, I'm talking in a very technical language, but then in a pandemic, how would you read that? And what would it would mean? And we made changes and then they were repurposing of certain budgets and resources and all of that. And we needed more capacity in the shelter. Uh, we needed an isolation board. Uh, there were teams who were working in the field. So, I think at the end, what I have to say is, and I have to share is that um, uh, one is that, and especially in the coming six months, seven months, or maybe, you know, one year, we don't know till when the situation is going to be there. I think all of us who are working on this issue, they, we have to live with two assumptions that while this virus is going to be there, but at the same time, we will have to continue and actually make our services much more intense. I mean, there is no two ways about it. And that's what we communicated to our team is that we will continue to exist and we have to. And we, by locking down women in the house, we may save them from virus, but then they are being exposed to a huge uh, risk of uh, domestic violence. So yeah, I think this is from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rashmi. So yes, the lockdown might save the women from the virus, but it may not save them from domestic violence. Uh, may I request Lorna uh, you know, to, to share her insights with us. Lorna is a program specialist at the United Nations Trust Fund for Ending Violence Against Women. She's worked at the UN for about 20 years. Uh, her notable assignments have included field service in the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations in difficult situations. She's worked in Mogadishu, in Somalia, in, uh, UN, and in, under the UN OSOM. 
She's worked with, the, she's provided headquarter support for UN missions in Eritrea and in Ethiopia and the DRC. Prior to joining UNTF, she was with the UN Women's Policy Division. She manages the portfolio of the UNTF, Ending Violence Against Women for Asia Pacific, and the special window for its focused on refugee and forcibly displaced women and girls. She has a master's in public administration from Columbia University. Lorna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, to everyone. Thank you very much for that introduction, uh, um, Professor. Um, so um, uh, we heard, thank you very much to IHD uh, and the Center for Gender Studies for giving us this opportunity for everyone to um, uh, participate in this uh, conversation. Uh, we heard from my colleague Shruti already about her very insightful rapid assessment of the impact on COVID-19 uh, on CSOs. Um, let me just share my screen first. So, oh, you can you all see my screen? Can you confirm? Okay, yeah. So um, again, uh, we've heard from Shruti, um, uh, her very insightful uh, uh, presentation. And uh, thanks to the input of many of our um, partner organizations that, that, was, uh, that was possible to be done. And then also you heard from Rashmi, uh, who shared her experience as a CSO, and she's a valu valuable partner of the UN Trust Fund. She's always ready. Uh, when we want to um, hear uh, uh, what's happening on the ground, she's always been available to us, so we are grateful for that. And their patience with uh, dealing with the trust fund, also with all the um, uh, uh, you know requirements that we have at the fund. And my my role in this uh, conversation is to share the trends that I've observed from a donor's perspective on the impact of COVID nineteen on GBV. Um, is Organizations like uh, Rashmi's uh, are our front line. On the part of the UN Trust Fund, we are the front line uh, folks because uh, we deal directly with the um, with the grantee organizations. So, um, sorry, just to give an idea of the breadth of the portfolio that I handle, um, it's about a nine million dollar portfolio. I work with in seventeen countries with twenty five active partners. Um, two of them are in India, actually. Uh, so 14 of these partners are in Asia Pacific and the other are in uh, mostly post-conflict or conflict uh, countries. Actually. So uh, to give you an idea of the, the insights that I've collected, right? So um, uh, I also wanted to give you uh, context to the perception of, that I'm about to share with you. Um, so I wanted to share the role of the UN Trust Fund. So um, I think a little introduction is called for. I have this one slide. Basically, the UN Trust Fund is a 24-year-old trust fund. Uh, we're an interagency fund, which means that um, um, in our board, uh, we have um, several U uh, UN agencies that sit there, uh, and we are administered by UN women. So we have um, an annual call for proposals. Sometimes we have two, depending on the, uh, the situation. We are demand-driven and competitive. We have no regional focus per se. Uh, we're global and um, the, the organizations that submit applications to us are, uh, have to be on, on the OECD's uh, Development Assistance uh, Committee list. We are a pooled funding mechanism, so there is no earmarking uh, by uh, uh, contributing, co contributing uh, uh, donors. Um, uh, but we, we, we are, we're, we're trying to see what's, what's going to happen, what's in it for us in the future. And uh, the basic guiding principles to give you a, an idea of the personality of the trust fund, we are a very high touch fund. We don't just give out the money and then forget about it. We, uh, we, we follow the grantee from project design. We guide them in designing indicators, in designing the results framework, and then we accompany them in the implementation and we also accompany them in the at the end of the project for external evaluation. We are very focused on capacity development. Um, we have online and in-person capacity development opportunities for our grantees. We are women's organization focused and increasingly we had been focused on small organizations because we wanted to uh, stress the importance of localization because we understand the importance of um, uh, uh, civil society organizations and community-based organizations. So now you know a little bit about the UN Trust Fund and about how we operate. 
um, once COVID-19 hit and was declared a pandemic, um, you could tell as a frontline uh, a person for the UN Trust Fund, you could tell that there was a, you know, there was a palpable panic uh, amongst grantees, right? I received a lot of emails, a lot of Skype messages asking us about, you know, uh, is, it, is it okay that we're going to be delayed? Can we, can we stop our project for a while? So um, I thought it was very um, important to have an immediate engagement through dialogues with the grantees. Um, the earliest dialogue we had was on 19 March, which is very early. And um, as Rashmi said, there were, I think there were 14 um, grantees that participated and gave their views about, the, um, about what's happening on, on the ground for them. And from the UN Trust Fund's perspective, I just wanted to give them assurance that you know, we know what's happening um, also, that so that everybody knows that everybody's project is going to be delayed, and it's okay, and we're going to be continuing to uh, uh, accompany you in this um, in this um, uh, journey and try as our, our best to support you. So after the consultations, because after that that first Asia Pacific um, dialogue, there were three other consultations that were um, uh, convened by the UN Trust Fund. Aside from that, there were also surveys. So after all of these consultations. Uh, we came up with, a, the UN Trust Fund came up with a five-point action plan uh, to address the immediate needs of the, the civil society organizations that we're working with. And um, we released uh, about $980,000 as emergency relief fund for 98 of our grantees. Um, and then we also um, allowed for more flexibility towards, um, sorry, I, I can't see the, the, the one second. There we go. So we allowed for more flexibility towards supporting sustainability of CSOs via a new institutional strengthening call with an envelope of uh, $9 million, which is in progress right now. Actually, we're reviewing proposals. Um, and then uh, we also engaged in more listening to co-create solutions and respond to, um, uh, to the needs, emerging needs, and enabling grantees to adopt to their project. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of the, um, the action plan that I spoke about. We acknowledge and approve delays in grantee reporting. We told the grantees that we're going to exercise utmost flexibility to enable them to modify or delay certain project activities, allowing for adaptation. Um, we uh, committed to sharing resources and guidance to help grantees navigate the public health crisis. Um, and we, as Rashmi mentioned, we accepted budget reallocation requests to meet core costs to ensure that business continuity happens and uh, to minimize the negative impact of COVID-19 uh, for our partner CSLs. And we also um, will be approving no-cost extensions requests for grantee projects, uh, possibly for three months during this um, uh, uh, pandemic. And um, throughout COVID-19, uh, we tried to focus our... Um, on GBV, as uh, Rashmi mentioned, um, we communicated that you know we're still concerned about GBV, but we understand that um, some of the activities might have to be, uh, uh, or some of the the funds might have to be repurposed for for other um, uh, uses, right? So the key takeaways for me as a uh, from the practitioners is that all risk factors of GBV were heightened by COVID nineteen. These risk factors, as Shruti mentioned, were already existing before GBV, but they have been heightened. It created a lot of situational poverty, for example, and made absolute poverty even worse, especially in, uh, let's say, in conflict or post-conflict situations. Um, it affected access to justice, uh, which is already a risk factor, access to healthcare, access to education. And for us, it underlined the importance of economic empowerment as being inextricably linked uh, to GBV. Not that we did not know this before, but now we're paying more attention to economic empowerment interventions. And there is more discussion at the fund on how we can um, uh, design holistic projects that have economic empowerment. And then another uh, key takeaway for me, uh, for, for vulnerable key populations, um, they are made even more vulnerable. Uh, we work with a whole uh, uh, breadth of uh, projects that work with um, different kinds of uh, populations. Right? We, we have projects that work with sex workers, with rural women, with indigenous women, women in shelters, the urban poor, victims of trafficking, adolescent women and young girls, um, disabled women, um, LGBTQ and widows. So all of these uh, vulnerable key populations have been made more vulnerable by this, um, 
pandemic. And then um, another important thing I learned uh, from, uh, from my engagement with the grantees is that um, as they are the frontline workers, they also have their own frontline workers, right? Um, who are uninsured usually. They get a, an allowance or a small stipend and uh, most of them are, are not covered by social safety nets that uh, um, some of us are lucky enough to have. So uh, we would like also to focus, we should really as donors focus also on, the, on supporting the frontline front workers, just like how in, in the whole world, I think uh, we're all uh, starting to um, uh, give more uh, credit and appreciate the frontline workers um, by increasing wages and uh, providing more social safety nets, right? And then um, another uh, key um, takeaway is, uh, you know, speaking to grantees, I realized that there are short term and there's a short term and a long term menu of assistance that they need. There's the emergency relief assistance that we're providing, right, which includes, uh, uh, you know, they tell you we want to provide um, uh, cash transfer so that our beneficiaries can buy food, to provide PPEs, um, uh, wash, you know, um, hygiene kit, kits, um, wa hand wash stations, all of these things which are um, uh, in the short term necessary during this pandemic. But there are also long term uh, assistance that they need so that their organizations can be made uh, sustainable, right? They need training in, um, uh, you know, um, how to deal with remote monitoring and evaluation, for example. Uh, they need um, assistance on uh, training their staff on uh, 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 providing uh, uh, more gender sensitive uh, uh, support to their um, beneficiaries. They need um, more robust uh, uh, work from home equipment and systems, for example. So we have opened um, uh, more opportunities for them to be able to, and I think we should continue and think really more deeply about the, the longer term assistance that the um, uh, organizations need. Um, and I also wanted to share a few uh, uh, the experiences of a few of um, um, the grantees under my, my portfolio, which I think are interesting. Um, there is a strategic initiatives for women in the Horn of Africa. Uh, it's a school based uh, South Sudan project. Um, so they've reported that the lockdown of borders and movement between regions have had a dramatic impact on the availability of goods uh, for, for families. And then women's ability to earn a living as commodity prices have risen rapidly. Um, some types of businesses have been banned, such as tea sellers, which is usually, um, off, you know, uh, uh, um, women are usually employed to do this in South Sudan. Um, there, as more people remain at home and households struggle to earn a living, violence against women and girls has increased, like everybody has said in this uh, panel so far. Domestic violence, family violence, such as early and forced marriage has increased. And the latter, which is um, uh, forced marriage and early marriage, is particularly worrisome as schools are closed and the girls don't have uh, an outlet to report these things. And families are increasingly seeking bride price as a means of, uh, means of making ends meet. So um, uh, these are just some of the um, uh, um, things that they've shared with us, uh, strategic initiatives of, for women in the Horn of Africa. Um, and then I have another uh, uh, post-conflict uh, grantee in Kenya, the Forum for Women in Development, Democracy and Justice. They work with refugee, adolescent girls and young women uh, who are usually um, uh, victims of trafficking, become victims of trafficking. Um, and pre-COVID, the most common GBV cases they reported included rape, defilement, unpaid or underpaid labor, domestic violence, and violent discipline by their, family, by their own family members. And post-COVID, the girls have uh, reported that uh, they have even more reduced access to hygiene and sanitary materials. So, um, uh, uh, the grantees providing that now. Food has become scarcer, forcing women and girls to engage in negative coping mechanisms um, that they used to, like, you know, uh, uh, sexual favors, um, uh, uh, for example. But this also includes uh, something that uh, might not always be so obvious. They consume less food because there's less uh, um, available resources, and this predisposes them to um, more 
to COVID infection. Um, and the project uh, has uh, uh, an economic empowerment uh, component. They train uh, girls in computers and create that network for these young women. And the closure of the project because of COVID-19, um, unfortunately, it was this great setback for these some 50 uh, girls that are in their project uh, because that was the only, that, that was one of the more important social protection networks that they had. And with COVID-19, this has eroded some of it and it's become very traumatic for some of these girls that they are unable to um, access their social network. And uh, last, uh, I wanted to just uh, mention uh, another project uh, based in Bangladesh uh, and it's uh, implemented by a grantee called Bada Bon Sangho. Amid the COVID-19 situation, um, uh, the Bada Bon Sangho project, by the way, works with uh, women landowners who are being harassed uh, uh, by their either relatives or uh, land brokers because they, they want access to the land that they own, right? That the women own. So amid COVID-19 situation, some of these marginal far women farmers are falling into hard times and are more willing to sell their land, which is the only asset sometimes that they have and the only source of income that they have. Um, and the situation has been promoting, the COVID situation has been promoting domestic violence against women and girls. Um, in the lockdown situation, um, they're becoming more vulnerable. They don't have any savings, these women, and they are disconnected from their family because of the lockdown. Um, they can't go to the market to buy necessary things and people have been facing difficulties meeting their daily needs, especially for, for food, for basic food items. And um, Bada Bon Sangho is trying to, um, it's a very community-based project. So they are trying to have uh, these uh, uh, um, community meetings to inform uh, women, and, uh, women landowners about their rights, uh, about land ownership and uh, how to um, access legal support. But this also has been affected by COVID-19 uh, because of the lockdown and the, and the uh, you know, instituted by the government. So uh, a lot of um, uh, examples like this. And so uh, just to end, looking ahead and gearing up as a donor, um, we know that grantees are trying to increase the availability of services to respond to an increase in GDZ incidents, just like Rashmi mentioned. So as a donor, we have to <coughs> we realize our, our role and we have to provide the uh, um, uh, flexible and immediate support to our grantees in supporting them. Um, there is uh, also a need for increase in trained professionals and community workers or paraprofessionals. The field that we work in, gender-based violence, we, we've been doing this for over 20 years, so we are aware um, of the uh, 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 risks also involved, right? So if you increase trained professionals, um, some of our grantees also have to do things that are outside of their normal um, uh, duties. Now they're in involved in wash. Now they're involved in food distribution. Now they're involved in uh, remote monitoring and evaluation and remote the uh, um, uh, access to um, or availability of um, psychosocial services. All of these, uh, we have to take uh, note of the duty of care, the do no harm principle, which uh, the UN Trust Fund um, uh, very closely adheres to. So we have to be very careful with, with the training of, um, of uh, our partners. And even if activities and services can restart, actually, households will be slow in regaining financial stability that the crisis has caused. Um, so we have to um, increasingly provide economic empowerment, let's say, to savings groups to make them more sustainable. Uh, and we need to uh, focus more on economic interven interventions during this pandemic. And this also has knock-on effects on the focus on GDD, not only by the communities, but also the governments and other stakeholders, donors, health providers, formal and informal justice actors. So um, uh, we also have to be geared up and prepared for all of these things. Our grantees work in low-income countries, um, communities, um, and some are in post-conflict uh, territories. So we have to also keep that in mind that... Um, that the, there's a wide context or there's a wide uh, uh, diversity in, 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 in the solutions that we, we should have a wide diversity in the solutions that we offer.
So um, with that, I end and um, uh, I know that there is a, a question and answer following, so I had to rush my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lorna. So what's very clear from your presentation is the heightening of the risk factors due to COVID-19. So it's made absolute poverty worse, decreased access to healthcare, decreased access to justice, decreased access to education, increased vulnerability of those who were already vulnerable, that uh, businesses were banned, that forced marriage uh, has created problems for many young girls, families are seeking bride prices in order to survive, and that there are negative coping mechanisms such as seeking bride price, and women landowners being harassed, and therefore the need for donors to be flexible and come in with whatever support they can so that grassroots organizations and grantees can support above and beyond the VAW for which they, you know, which is what they had committed to. And suddenly the grassroots organizations are having to support uh, provisioning of food and provisioning of safe shelter and safe houses to deal with COVID and various others. So it's, you know, so, so at least, you know, so from listening to Shruti and you, one gets a sense of how you all have had to respond to the situation on the ground. And from listening to Rashmi, the kind of needs that they had to meet and therefore why they had to turn to donors to be more flexible to respond to the needs of women on the ground. We've got a whole host of questions in the queue. In the Q and A, uh, Priyanka, how how far can we take this? Uh, Ma'am, uh, officially it is seven, but you can start the session. We'll see. We can go okay. a little Let's longer start as the well. Q and A, and we'll take it as far as we can. As far as we can. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, so let me start with the um, uh, you know the first set of questions. Um, come up with three questions. One is how are the numbers of increased violence estimated? And are repeat cases or old cases included, uh, excluded or included when you talk about numbers? The second is um, grassroots functionaries also report family bonding and more harmony in the same household. So have you seen any instances of this as well? And there's a third question on, uh, you know, on the fact that efforts have, you know, for dealing with domestic violence uh, have been made since social reform time to the DVA Act 2005. Lots of efforts have been made to curb domestic violence, but they've met with very limited success. So the question is, uh, you know, what next? How, you know, what is the roadmap uh, to eradicate this evil, especially uh, in the context of, uh, of the United Nations? So uh, would Shruti like to start with answering whatever you can while I start looking at uh, uh, you know, so if the three of you can just sort of answer the questions, I'll start looking at the Q&A. Great. Thanks, Professor Mehta. So on the question of um, how is it measured? I mean, measurement in this field is possibly the trickiest, um, pre, you know, even pre-pandemic. This is, this is an extremely hard um, uh, field in terms of getting accurate numbers on prevalence of violence, right? So the two sort of, in terms of numbers, just numbers, there's qualitative data, but that's, that's a whole separate thing. But in terms of the numbers, the two that are principally relied on, one is administrative data, right? So police records, health records, etc. And they're all measured very differently, even within the same municipality, you'll have the police take records a separate way and identify a certain form of violence in a certain way and the health workers identify it and record it in a certain way and call it something else, right? The very same form of violence. But also in some, they're recording the number of cases and in some they're recording the number of women that come in, right? So that, you know, it, it's extremely tricky. It's very hard to standardize, but that's one principal form of sort of data, administrative data. And then there's survey data. So there's prevalence surveys, there's national population-based surveys, et cetera, that, that, that ask the question about, you know, have you, um, experienced violence in the last 12 months and, and ask about forms of violence. But that kind of data and that kind of survey in the current environment is becoming extremely tricky. As Rashmi mentioned, you know, with, with women within households, it's very tricky to be doing phone surveys at this point when they are trapped in with their perpetrators. So generally, this, you know, the surveys are taking a step back at this point and, and, and proceeding with a lot of caution. There are some grantees that have experience in this 
um, for a long time, grantees that have worked with women and girls with disabilities that have always had mobility constraints do have tools and measures of how to collect violence when you can't, when you, when you, when women don't leave the home. So, uh, you know, it's, it's tricky and it's, it's measured differently, but um, uh, yeah, I hope that helps sort of give the landscape. The data that we are getting now is a third kind of data, right? This is monitoring data of civil society organizations. These are shelters, these are uh, legal aid centers, these are health services like Rashmi's. These are their data from their monitoring. And uh, you know, often it's not just about the numbers, it's about the forms of violence, it's about whether it's repeat cases or not, whether it's what is the duration of some of these cases, are these one-time consultations or are these sort of you know, prolonged cases? So th there's a lot, it, in my opinion, the data coming from there is a lot richer in a certain sense. Thanks, I'll stop there. Yeah, Lorna? Yeah, I, I can add a little bit to what Shruti said, um, and I agree, uh, we all know this, that it's very tricky to measure this. It has a lot of ethics um, uh, and safety concerns, so we are also very wary and careful when we get a proposal and a grantee says we are going to measure uh, uh, you know, violence in the community. So the immediate question we ask is, how are you going to do that? And some of, you know, are you going to knock door door to door and say, oh, is there violence in your family, which is not safe and not ethical at all? So, uh, you know, these are the things that uh, make us nervous uh, about reading proposals and we have to be careful with. There's also a difference in, um, you know, in the perceived ac access to, re uh, to safe reporting and also willingness to report uh, depends very much on that. If you think that it's safe to report and it, you're, you're your reporting will actually result into something then you're incentivized to report but if you know that you know this 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 there's corruption happening left and right or whatever it you know it's not very uh, helpful it wouldn't be very helpful for you to report so these are the the issues that we have in reporting and then like uh, what rashmi also mentioned earlier you know even when you do get a uh, the data there's increase or there's a decrease there's usually an underlying factor. So you, do, you don't take the data as is. You have to um, uh, do some um, more thinking and more um, investigation to find out what factors um, are affecting this increase or this decrease in data. So it, it really is very tricky. Um, and sorry, I, I can't say any more than that. Rashmi? Rashmi, would you like to add? Uh, no, I think Lorna and Shruti, um, uh, they have added. So I, I don't think that uh, I have anything else to add. But yeah, for some other questions, I have certain yeah. things. To okay. Um, let, me, let me start with more questions. Uh, there's one that uh, directly pertains to you, Rashmi, which is, um, uh, what are the issues? You know, I'll just read out two or three questions and then... Um, so one question is, what are the issues faced by the LGBTQ community uh, in the context of violence against women? So uh, in, the, in the context of violence, then there's another one on, uh, you know, could you throw any light on the situation of uh, VAW in um, urban slums in India? And uh, then there's a point about if we emphasize on, on um, uh, you know, on economy, I guess what, what, what is meant is if, uh, if, the, if we are able to provide support through income earning, and if we are able to provide emotional resilience, then can domestic violence be sorted out is what uh, the person has written. And okay, let's answer these three and then, or, you know, and then move forward. There's, I've just noted down another two long questions. Yeah. So I think I'll start on the first one because that's the question I saw. It is, is about that um, the economic crisis, uh, one of the manifestations or the fallout of economic crisis and the economy is domestic violence. Yeah, we, we understand that and it may be. And, you know, and there are so many factors which tell us that. But what we want to keep the focus on that under no circumstance violence against women is acceptable. So, you know, there isn't any uh, excuse. And yes, we definitely, and going to your last question, that if we address some of these uh, economic issues, uh, then is that a way to also address domestic violence? Um, 
uh, I, I think that's a very, you know, taking a very uh, long shot uh, that, okay, we, we will work on this and then obviously the, uh, the fallout of it would be the domestic violence will uh, reduce. Uh, but then at the same time, we also need to directly work on domestic violence and the services and strengthening the, the state's services, etc. Um, coming to uh, the kind of issues what we have seen uh, the individuals from the LGBTQI community and the last three years we've had like a lot of cases um, of where, uh, where you know, uh, individuals have come. Um, for most of them, the cases, the, the, the kind of violence has been family violence and uh, non-acceptance of their sexual orientation, sexual preferences by the family and by the community. Um, so I think in, in, more, in many of the cases, it has been family violence uh, and then they needing shelter because either the family doesn't want them or they are not acceptable in the community or where they are working, then the employer doesn't want them. So immediately they have been want. And the other kind of violence and support it has been that if suppose there are people who are wanting to go for, uh, you know, surgeries. Uh, so that's something where they need a place to stay or, uh, you know, some financial support, some legal support. So these have been some of, the, and of course, psychosocial and emotional, and especially when they are in that transition period, uh, you know, when they are taking hormones and a lot of changes are happening. So also, I think it's around that. But slowly, we have also seen that ultimately for any kind of violence the, the, at the center lies the power. And when we have seen uh, lesbian couples or, you know, gay couples, where you also see similar kind of power dynamics and then abuse and violence happening. So we've had couples who have been staying at our shelter and they've, they've, they've had that. So if we have seen like a range of uh, things with the LGBTQI community. When we come to the urban slums, um, uh, I think that in the urban slum, this time what, especially in the rise of this pandemic, what we saw was uh, that the, the group which we work with in the urban slum and women, many of them were uh, the single women. Uh, and for them to actually step out during lockout, you know, lockdown and, you know, not having access to essential services uh, and then also um, um, and I think um, alcohol abuse uh, has been reported during that time across. So whether it was rural or urban. And as I said, I think yesterday when we were talking, the alcohol abuse started from a withdrawal symptom because alcohol wasn't available to reaching out to another peak in violence where, we, where, where women called and told us that uh, now alcohol is available. And now whatever money, little money was there, now he just wants to go and buy and even if there is no food in the uh, family. Yeah. Sati, did you want to add anything or Lorna? Or shall I move to the next set of questions? Yeah. Okay, then uh, there's a question about uh, with regard to intensification of violence against women with the pandemic. Um, is it related to the economic crisis, which is having a strong gender impact? Is that, that what you would say? That yeah? I already said, like, yeah. And, yeah. and uh, then there's another question on, in rural communities, women often don't have access to mobiles and they don't know what the helpline numbers are. They're not aware of helpline numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, how do you address issues yeah. of, uh, why, you know, the yeah. violence that they are facing? And related yeah. to that, there's another comment that uh, somebody has made, which is very useful, where she says that the NFH's data also points out that 41% of women don't have access to communications technology, and they have to borrow a phone to communicate. How does that, uh, uh, you know, how you know how does that help them uh, in the context of you know of having a 1091 or 181 or any other helpline? One zero one nine eight. You know any other helpline numbers? So, uh, yeah. so would you like to take those first? Yeah. So anyone else wants to go with this question, or I can take. Go ahead, Rashmi. Okay. Okay. 
so again, I think it's a very, very valid question. And when we were publicizing the hotline number, this was constantly on our mind. And in all districts of Tamil Nadu, we work with the very local organizations who are who are present and their frontline workers are present in the community. Uh, so at that time, what we did was, and especially we did this in around 13 districts, we did this very rigorously, that we actually connected with the one-stop crisis center uh, and then messages through different forms, uh, whether it was IC material or through radio uh, or, you know, through television, like some of, some of the, you know, some one celebrity, she put the number of the hotline on this thing and it went to the community radio. Uh, and then from there, women were able to reach out. At least they were able to uh, use even if somebody else's phone uh, and they have called and immediately when they have called on the crisis line, they said, don't ask, don't call me. I will call you. You know, so it was, so th these were some of the things. Uh, and I think, but this has also been a learning that yes, even if you have these ways of communicating that these services are available, we really need to figure out that how do we reach to that large group who doesn't have uh, access to that kind of technology and that that uh, uh, information yeah yeah i can come in on on yeah, uh, yeah i can come in on the, on, on the global level on that question and i think there's two two interesting questions there one is how do you get available services to women when you know when you can't reach them through the phone and the other is what do you do when there aren't any services and there aren't any phones in the very communities that women live in right and some of the interesting examples we have on the latter for example we have a faith-based uh, intervention in liberia which is primarily rural you know and, and and services are at large distances from each other at least five to six hours away from, uh, uh, you know, where, uh, with, from rural communities. In those cases, women are still turning to faith leaders. They are still seeking advice. They are still seeking help. So in that situation, what is happening is organizations are training faith leaders to become the focal points for referral services, right? So they're training them to provide very basic counseling. They're training faith leaders not to tell women that this is a private matter, please mediate it, you know, let's, let's figure out a solution. They're training faith leaders to be more aware of these issues and to, uh, you know, refer them to the right services then, right? So one of the things, and overall, overall, in general, we're seeing this, there's a huge push towards strengthening the, 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 the community to become the first responders that can then sort of give, give referrals to services. I just uh, wanted to add to what the, they both said. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, I was going to say that community-based protection systems are very powerful um, uh, and community-based monitoring by, you know, community members, community accountability systems, building community accountability, accountability systems in, in, in your local neighborhood is very important. Um, and all of our, the grantees in, in my portfolio basically highlight the invaluable work of, um, they call them different things. It could be a woman, women leaders, or it could be a field facilitator. It could be called a community organizer, but these are all based in the community. And this is how um, they are reaching people who don't have access to um, uh, phones. Um, and another thing is that, you know, this is another um, uh, a problem that uh, COVID highlighted is the digital divide, right? That um, uh, we, we also have to uh, pay attention to that. Okay, um, another round of questions. Uh, one is specifically to Lorna asking you whether um, your call for grants is only for CSOs or whether academia academics can also apply. I'll add some more questions and then, uh, and then close the Q&A round. Then there's a question on, um, COVID-19, uh, you know, has given the opportunity to work from home. So is this safer for a working woman or not? And there's a question on, has a lockdown increased among the upper strata, but not among the socially lower strata? And can you throw a uh, light on this? That is whether, is it uh, the upper income groups that are suffering, um, you know, from uh, more of violence during the lockdown? than the lower income strata. So that's uh, one question. Then there's, uh, there's also a, a longer point that somebody has made, which I can just share and then not, you know, 
I don't think we can really respond to that, but I can just quickly share it where, uh, uh, where there's, there's somebody who works with the Center for Human Rights and Social Welfare and is facing problems in COVID, sexual exploitation and violence against women, where the concern is really that, you know, they're making products, uh, uh, you know, but then they don't have market and finance at this time. And so that's an issue or students cannot uh, be studying because they cannot afford to pay the fees uh, for their classes and so on. So I think with that, I think we can close the Q&A now. Yeah, so if you can just respond to the upper and lower income strata and uh, Lorna, the question specifically to you and then the work from home. Okay, um, shall I take the, it's a more uh, easiest, uh, uh, easier question to answer, right? So the uh, um, eligibility. A little louder, you, little louder. Sorry, sorry. Uh, the eligibility is, is a little bit uh, more straightforward to answer. So um, uh, it, we, like I said, we have an annual call for proposal and you can go to our uh, website for the eligibility criteria. Um, uh, as I said, uh, uh, the countries have to be in OECD countries um, uh, that apply. And as to the question of academic institutions, we don't have a lot of um, academic institution partners because we have uh, the main partners, right? So when you apply for a grant, you can have a, you can have a, we have a main partner and that main partner can have implementing partners. So I believe academic institutions would be more suited to be an implementing partner of our main partner. But uh, you have to be legally registered, um, a legally registered CSO, and you would have to have previous experience on working on um, uh, uh, Ending violence against women or GBV to qualify, but uh, we can share the website with you so that you can see the eligibility, the full eligibility requirements for the UN Trust Fund. Okay. Um, Shruti, Rashmi, would you like to add to any of the other questions? Nothing. Shruti. I. Okay, it's Lauren again. Oh, Shruti, did you want to say something? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I wasn't going to address th these questions that were um, just asked, but the other previous questions that were asked, because I think there were three uh, about the, um, uh, the fa you know, the positive, the positive uh, reports on uh, or the positive um, uh, results of uh, COVID-19. So yeah. uh, there, there is that very common uh, or, or well-known adage, right, that says that crisis situations allows us to do things that were thought to be impossible before. So as a, as, a, as a donor for the UN Trust Fund, we've always been interested in supporting uh, civil society organizations with a, you know, a higher per percentage of core support because uh, we've had dialogues, we've had conventions, and this, this has, as always has an overwhelming consensus among donors and among grantees that they need course, more core support. Uh, currently, we provide 7% of core support. So um, COVID-19 presented us with the opportunity to, um, to do this right now. As a matter of fact, our new call, uh, the $9 million call that I mentioned earlier, um, provides for institutional capacity, capacity development to strengthen the you know, sustainability of the organization. So in a way, this is one of the positive things that came out of COVID-19. It allowed us to change our, uh, you know, or to try and um, uh, start to change the funding landscape so that uh, we can provide more core support for our grantees. Um, and then there was another, sorry. And then there was another, the third question was about uh, what the UN strategy was um, uh, to, to, uh, to stop uh, ending violence against women. Like I said, we have been in this business for 24 years now. We haven't uh, um, uh, defeated the, 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 the problem of, of violence against women. But our recently, because also of COVID-19, our SG has come up with, um, uh, has been very vocal about his support to um, ending violence against women and instruments like the UN Trust Fund so that um, donors would support us because he sees that we are directly supporting the civil society organizations, which are, we're finding out now, really our key partners and the, the you know, the key, um, uh, a key ally in, in solving these issues, right? Because we know that the, you know, a lot of um, uh, studies have confirmed that the weakest link usually is that community-based um, uh, arm uh, uh, to, to um, end this, um, this uh, 
this issue of ending violence against women, even if you have, usually even if you have um, uh, national decrees or uh, laws about uh, violence against women, it's not enough. You have to go to the grassroots, you have to go um, to the local government units sometimes the, uh, to, to be able to implement these laws, right? Uh, and also, um, on, on, for the UN Trust Fund specifically, we're also doing a lot of work on movement building um, uh, trying to um, uh, um, and join others in uh, in in building uh, uh, you know a stronger uh, uh, movement for ending violence violence against women. We we're giving it a focus right now so that uh, CSOs can network more with other organizations to build a stronger movement. Um, and we know that all these factors are sticky factors. We've, they've been with us forever. And uh, we, it really needs a concerted effort. And that's what our Secretary General also has um, uh, uh, stressed, that the UN family has to um, really uh, get together and get behind this uh, problem of ending violence against women. Yeah. Uh, Rashmi, did you want to add anything? Shruti, did you want to add anything? Or shall I start closing? I can quickly add on the question. Sorry, Rashmi, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Shruti. No, there was one more question which you talked about the upper middle class and the privileged. Upper, yeah, upper strata, lower strata. Yeah. yeah can you repeat that question? Whether uh, the there's, question. Go ahead. Sorry. Whether there's a difference between in, in patterns yeah. in terms of experiencing more violence based on class. Has so, the lockdown increased among upper strata but not the socially lower strata? Yeah. I think, I mean, from the India perspective, Rashmi can come in, but from a global perspective, from our perspective, what, what you know, we don't, we don't have that data on, on poverty, but one thing that really sort of came as a, I won't say it came as a surprise, but one thing that's immense is that clearly our projects were and are focused very much on the poor and who did get pushed into poverty because of this. And if you think about the categories of women we're working with, right? We're talking trans girls in Paraguay. We're talking women with disabilities in Rwanda. We're talking ISIS survivors in Iraq. We're talking trafficking victims in Serbia, displaced and refugee girls in South Sudan. These are already sort of, you know, disproportionately poor and vulnerable and marginalized girls. So our lens is very much that. So I can't quite speak to that. But in general data, I mean, uh, in, from India, I think, Rashmi, perhaps you can come in on. Yeah. Uh, just one thing I'll add is that uh, violence exists across, like, socioeconomic, caste, religion. I mean, it doesn't spare any mm -hmm. cat category or group. Um, but what we have seen is that maybe in the urban slums or maybe, like, you know, uh, not privileged uh, uh, groups, uh, they are more open and vocal about talking uh, about what's happening and they will come out of the house and they will seek and as Lorna said that there is already a community-based support. Uh, but what we have seen in this pandemic, especially when we talk about a hotline and it reaches to a, to a certain group or the section of society in the women, uh, and we all know that act the real silence lies in, in the upper middle class and the middle class. Uh, and uh, and we, there, from there, we have seen that where we have got calls. We've always got calls. And, st and that's why what we have learned is that every time when any forum we talk, it is about like, okay, what will happen to the poor women? You know, of course, a poverty, economic and poverty and everything has a manifold impact on violence as well. But I think even in the upper middle class, this is something which is the only difference is that you know, due to so many reasons. Um, I, I think if the lower uh, income group uh, women don't speak, it is because of poverty. And I think maybe in the upper middle class, women don't reach out for support because of no other alternate. And, you know, the whole idea of getting used to, to be, you know, living in that kind of a setting of facilities, of services. So, you know, there are so many um, reasons for that, but it exists everywhere. Yeah. Uh, shall I begin to close? Yeah. I think uh, we've had a really rich uh, set of presentations and discussion, questions, lots of questions. Still more are coming in. 
but I don't think we have time to open them and start uh, answering them. But you know, what is it that we really covered in the course of uh, this hour and a half? Basically, what Shruti told us was that yes, it's COVID and COVID-19 and yes, there's DAW, but it's actually the combinations uh, you know, that we are suffering from that really exacerbate the problem. So it's the food shortage and the lockdown. It's the school closure and the lockdown. It's the restricted access to schools and colleges and workspaces due to the lockdown. It's the unsupervised quarantine. It's the lack of public transport and lockdown. So it's the combination of all of these that has worsened or exacerbated the situation as far as violence against women is concerned. And in that context, and she's given us uh, you know, a sense of how uh, various CSOs across the globe have reacted and responded. And so she said that you know, they basically hit the ground running. And in Serbia, for example, they've created safe houses and provided food. In Ethiopia, they've created a new shelter even at a police station. Uh, there's been a rapid expansion of helplines of WhatsApp groups that there's been data, you know, that we know that data collection during a pandemic is not possible. There are huge ethical issues around that. So yes, you, you know, it is true that you cannot be collecting data at this time, but work with, with civil society organizations at, and partners who have their year totally fixed to the ground because they know and they have their finger on the pulse of what's happening with women on the ground in the areas in which they work. So trust them and work with them and help provide support to the women who are demanding that support through those CSOs by working with them and, uh, and trusting them. And, there's, and she, you know, she really flagged this point about the need for investing in civil society organizations as well, because that's, what's, you know, that's, what, that's what every government has finally counted on uh, to reach uh, the poor and the vulnerable, and uh, women victims of, uh, of, and girls who are victims of violence at this time. Rashmi, you know, flagged the importance of a coordinated response between those who are making the grants and those who are using the grants, and the need for being able to rework whatever log frames you had to start with, because those log frames cannot be adhered to during a pandemic. And, and that there is a need for essential services on the ground, and this need is even greater during a pandemic. So you need supportive partners for repurposing grants at this time. And Lorna uh, walked us through the heightening of the risk factors due to COVID-19 and the fact that absolute poverty is worse, that there's reduced access to healthcare. In fact, you know, there's another group that I work with who've been talking about the, the low access of women who are pregnant and about to deliver babies in order to, you know, to get access to the healthcare that they need. And that's also been reported in, in the press. So, you know, so the reduction in access to healthcare is something that all of us know. Justice, because courts in any case are functioning at much lower levels. Education with uh, schools closed and the increased vulnerability of vulnerable people. But then what really was worrying was the negative um, uh, coping mechanisms that people are coming up with, such as forced marriages and bride prices, and, uh, and the fact that people want to hijack the little land that women have in their names. So the need for donors to be as flexible and as supportive as possible, and, and recognizing that their grantees have to be supported above and beyond just BAW in order to address the issues that are being raised by women who are suffering from violence in these difficult times. I'd like to thank everybody who took the time to join us. Your questions really enriched uh, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, this discussion. And uh, very grateful to Shruti and to Lorna and to Rashmi for taking the time and to make presentations mm -hmm. and share with us all the work that you all have been doing in the context of making uh, the lives of those who are most vulnerable a little more livable. And my thanks also uh, to Tanuka and to Priyanka, my colleagues at IHD, and to everybody else who, who supported this entire process. There's a whole back room that's operating. That's why this, this whole thing is functioning. So Aditi and Vijay and everybody else at IHD, a huge thank you for making the live streaming work and for making this, fun this entire thing function without a glitch. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, yes. Be, be yes, back yes. your time.
and your participation. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, before we just uh, call it a close, Tanuka ji, one final remark if uh, you just want to come in for a final remark. Uh, nothing really. I just enjoyed it. It was absolutely, you know, I was engrossed. I think everybody who attended it also was. I probably would like to just mention Williams Day because yes, I I was he was the person who brought us together. So it's been just really, really interesting and so many issues and questions come to mind, but maybe at a later date. Yes. So, okay. yeah, thank you, Thanks, everyone. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Mehta, Professor Endo, and of course, thank you, Lorna, uh, Rashmi, Shruti, for such an engaging discussion. I am extremely honored to share screen space with all you ladies, all you women who have voiced uh, this very pertinent issue which women are facing. So thank you very much. It is a very proud moment for me. And to all the attendees, I just want to share that this time, the kind of attendance we've had, we've had people from trade unions, society organization academics young scholars people from abroad and they've all they are all sending me whatsapp messages and also are writing to us so thank you for a very informative enriching and a very engaging discussion so thank you to all the ladies and to all the attend uh, uh, attendees and participants yes uh, there was a slight glitch on youtube so we apologize for that however the entire recording of this uh, uh, session will be available on youtube you can engage with us send us your your uh, comments, all the questions, of course, we could not have taken, ma'am, of course, covered as much as she could, but I'll cre create a compendium, we'll share it with all the uh, panelists here. I'm sure they will be able to uh, reply to you after the panel discussion. And uh, please follow us on Facebook, please follow us on, uh, uh, you know, Twitter, and we will be, uh, you know, keep you, we will keep you updated, uh, and our website as well, uh, ihdindia.org, with all the uh, other webinars that we keep doing. And a small little thanks uh, uh, one uh, a couple of people, Wahid and Fatma at the back end who are handling our web pages, our YouTubes. They definitely deserve a big uh, round of thank you. And of course, Aditi for all the social media dissemination. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we look forward to many more such uh, uh, discussions and deliberations. Many thanks to everyone on the screen. Many thanks. Thank you. Thanks, thank Priyanka. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Priyanka. Thank you. Thank and thank you, you Beam. Yes, and, and yes, one final thank you, Dr. Bhim Reddy, for uh, organizing and getting everybody on board together here, which everybody has said, has said out here. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Keep in touch. Bye. Keep in touch, yes.